So good evening, everyone. This is Pastor Kohal, and I want to welcome you this evening again to our prayer meeting and community conversation. You know, each Wednesday night, we come together as a people from all over the city and from various parts of the country to pray, but also to be empowered by those who are on the front lines of our community and those who we believe have the best interests of our people and the community at heart. So wherever you're joining us, we want to welcome you to the LRBC Prayer and Community Conversation. Dr. Tamara Henry will lead us as we start in our meditation and prayer, and then I will introduce our very special guest, and we will start the conversation. Again, if you have questions um, that you need to be raised in the conversation, we, we can't get to all of the questions, but if you do, we're gonna ask you to write it into the chat section. And of course, we're using three, um, three ways of, um, of making the connection this evening. We have Zoom, YouTube, and Facebook. So wherever you're joining from, we wanna welcome you. Now, right after the interview with um, our guests, we have some specific prayer needs that we will raise before God and a few announcements thereafter. Again, welcome, Dr. Henry. Hey, so good night, everyone. Um, good night, LRBC family. I certainly want to uh, start off by just saying a quick thank you to Pastor um, for the invitation just to share in this brief centering thought um, and opening prayer. And I want to lift up as a framework for our time of prayer tonight, uh, just one verse from the passage of scripture that pastor shared on uh, so powerfully on Sunday, Genesis chapter 21. And I just want to lift up as again a framework for our time of prayer tonight, verse 17. And here begins the reading of God's word. God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. And one of the first uh, lessons that we learn as children, as we are taught to navigate our, our way through the world, is that we have these five senses, the ability, right? The sense of taste, touch, sight, smell, and hearing. And as I read this passage, Genesis 21, after Sunday in its entirety, and this verse in particular, one of the things it attunes me to and reminds me about as I come before God in prayer is that not only do we have senses, but guess what? God also has senses. And one of the first senses of God that we see lifted up in verse 17, just the one verse that I read, is God's capacity to hear. The first two words of the verse says, God heard. And we know that afterwards it goes on to say that God heard the boy cry, but it really doesn't matter what comes after, what is most significant, brothers and sisters, tonight as we think about prayer is that God is a God who hears, amen. There are so many times that we come and we offer prayer after prayer, week after week before God, and there's this sense that we feel that our prayers are falling on dead ears. But tonight we are reminded that God is not deaf. God heard the boy crying, and just as God heard the boy crying, Ishmael in the wilderness with his mother Hagar, God hears us tonight. It was Solomon who reminded us of these words of God, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. The book of 1 John puts it this way, now this is the kind confidence that we have if we ask anything not just something but anything according to his will we know that what he hears us 
And if we know that he hears us, we know we receive what we've asked of him. Uh, the psalmist David put it this way. This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and delivered him from all his fears. So as we go before God in prayer tonight, first thing I wanna remind you is God is not deaf. God is a God who hears. Not only is God is a God who, who hears, but God is also a God who sees. This same Hagar that Pastor referenced on Sunday in Genesis 21, in Genesis 16, has another encounter with God as she's on the run as a runaway slave from an oppressive situation with a young child where she has an encounter with God in another wilderness situation. And out of that encounter, she identifies God as El Roy, the God who sees me. And tonight, I want want to remind us that not only does God hear us when we come to him in prayer, but God also has the capacity to see us. And God has the tendency to see what others do not see. As sometimes as we're going through life, we can think nobody sees me, nobody notices me, especially as people of color. We know the history of our people in the United States has been this tendency towards not seeing our experiences of suffering or rendering us invisible, but tonight, irrespective of who sees us or who doesn't see us, we are coming into contact with El Roy through prayer, the God who not only hears us, but the God who sees us tonight. And finally, as we prepare for prayer, he is a God who hears, he is a God who sees, but finally, he is also a God who possesses the sense of touch. There are times where people can see the situations that we're going through. They can hear about our struggles, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are touched or moved by our experiences. And sometimes because of our experiences with people, we tend to think that God responds in the same way. But I want to encourage you tonight that nothing could be farther from the truth. There was a woman in a temple one day who touches the hem of Jesus's garment. And Jesus's first words after he recognizes this woman makes contact with him is who touched me? Mm. And isn't that what we are attempting to do through prayer tonight? To make contact with God, amen? To touch God, amen? And I want to remind us tonight that we have a God who says that he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. In other words, what hurts God, what hurts us, hurts God. God is touched by our feelings, our emotions, our experiencing. And so when we pray tonight, we have a high priest, which is what the book of Hebrews reminds us, who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses because he was tempted as we were, yet without sin. And because God, Jesus, was without sin, he's given us this privilege tonight of coming boldly before his throne to obtain mercy, to access help in the time of need. Yes. So irrespective of what your situation is tonight, I want to invite you right now to remind yourself as I open up in prayer that he's a God who sees, he's a God who hears, and he is a God who is touched by your experiences. Father, tonight we thank you for your faithfulness to us as your people, that you are a God who is intimately and intricately connected to the experiences of our lives. You do not just stand afar off, but you are a God who is close by. And tonight, according to your word, God, you said if we call to you, you would answer us and you would show us great and mighty things which we know not. So your people all over this city, wherever we are gathered, we're calling out to you in, in prayer tonight as saying, God, hear, saying, God, see, and saying, God, be touched by the experiences that we have. Lord, as we enter into this sacred conversation tonight, 
We pray that you would continue to increase our knowledge. For you say in your word that your people perish for a lack of knowledge. So give us knowledge tonight. Give us wisdom tonight that our situations that we offer through prayer and petition might be transformed because God, you are able to do exceedingly abundantly over what we can think, ask, or imagine. Uh, so God, we thank you tonight for these powerful reminders that irrespective of what we are experiencing tonight, you yeah. continue to hear us, you continue to see us, and you continue to be touched by our experiences. And so, Lord, we offer this prayer to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Dr. Henry, for those powerful Reminders, the God who sees, the God who hears, the God who reaches out and touch God's people. So we thank you so much for that centering moment in our prayer service. Towards the end, we will again um, close out in prayer. And there are specific needs that um, our, the members of our congregation and community, um, both uh, within the Lenox Road uh, Baptist Church area and beyond. Um, so, so just join us uh, again for prayer at the end. Well, our special guest this evening is, uh, well, you know, I almost, I almost introduced him as Reverend Riley. <laughs> Thank you. That's a compliment, Rev. <laughs> but he is Wayne J. Riley, MD, PhD, MBA, and <laughs> He is the 17th president of the state of the State University of New York, Downstate Health Sciences University. He's a distinguished physician, physician, academician, clinical educator, and administrator. Dr. Riley was unanimously, unanimously elected by the trustees of the SUNY system and began his tenure in 2017, April 2000. And 17. The institution that Dr. Riley leads is the only academic medical center serving Brooklyn, one of the most diverse communities in the nation. Since his appointment, Dr. Riley has worked to achieve high levels of excellence across downstate multiple enterprises. Immediately prior to joining downstate, Dr. Riley served as clinical professor of medicine and adjunct professor of healthcare management and health policy at the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He was the 10th president and chief executive officer of Meharry Medical College from 2000, 2007 to 2013. He began his career at Baylor uh, College of Medicine, where he rose to vice president and vice dean for health affairs and government relations. During that time, he also served as assistant chief of medicine at Ben Taub General Hospital, the safety net teaching hospital serving the, injured, serving the indigent and uninsured of Harris County and Houston, Texas. Prior to pursuing his career in medicine, he served in three capacities in the office of the mayor of the city of New Orleans. So Dr. Riley is president emeritus and a master of the American College of Physicians and an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, secretary and member of the board of directors, secretary treasurer of the Society of Medical Administration, and the list goes on and on. <laughs> of numerous awards and honors, including election to the Alpha, Alpha Omega, Alpha Honor Medical Society, and uh, he was recently awarded the SUNY Downstate Ilanthus Award for Outstanding Public Health Leadership. And he holds honorary degrees from SUNY Downstate, Tuskegee University, and Mount St. Joseph University. Dr. Riley earned his medical degree from the Morehouse School of Medicine. All right. He holds a bachelor's degree in anthropology with a concentration in medical anthropology from Yale University. He also holds a, a master's in public health degree in health systems management from Tulane uh, University School of Public Health 
and an MBA from Rice University, Jesse H. Jones Graduate School of Business. What a delight and a privilege and an honor to have you, Dr. Riley, president, current president of SUNY Downstate, to be with us this evening in our conversation. And so I'm going to ask all of those of you online, you're watching by YouTube, uh, Facebook, and Zoom, just to give him a virtual applause at, at this time. Thank all you, right. Reverend. Thank so, you, Reverend Dr. Kohal. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction that our mother loves. <laughs> <laughs> good to have you. Very good to have you. So let me start by asking you, can you talk a little bit about yourself and the work that you do for the community and for well, then, the medical institution? Yeah, thank you very much for the wonderful opportunity, Rev, to be with you and uh, your congregation. I know this is uh, Wednesday's a very special night uh, in in the church, uh, Bible study and, and meetings. And I know you've had to readjust uh, to do uh, the Wednesday night prayer and Bible uh, study service uh, remotely and virtually, like we all have had to adjust to virtual uh, sort of uh, interactions with each other. And and I should point out to your congregation that you are the chair of the Downstate Council appointed by governor, by the governor to uh, help uh, guide uh, Downstate. Your name goes on the diplomas for Downstate graduates just next to mine and just under the chancellor. So that's a a high exalted position when your name goes on uh, diplomas, Rev. So thank you for all you've done. I haven't seen you in a while. I must say that I like that quarantine beard there. I wish I could grow one. I'm kind of baby faced, <laughs> but uh, you look great and uh, glad to be with you. And to get to your uh, your specific question, to start off our conversation. Um, I have the wonderful honor of a lifetime to, uh, as I say, uh, I've been called to Brooklyn from the South, uh, you know, by the good Lord, he put me here. Uh, to give me the opportunity to lead Downstate Health Sciences University, which is one of the um, one of about 150 what we call academic health science centers in the country, and that's a fancy term for an institution that has a medical school, a nursing school, a public health school, a hospital, a graduate school, and a school of health professions. And that's the definition of an academic health science center. It's a hospital, a medical school, nursing school, public health school all together. So we're one of um, only of 150 in the country. We are the only one in Brooklyn, the only academic health science center in Brooklyn, as you mentioned in my introduction. So that means that we tr not only do we take care of patients at our hospital, University Hospital of Brooklyn, which is down the road from Lenox Road Baptist Church, but we train medical students, we train nurses, we train PAs, physician assistants, we train um, medical informaticists, we train public health folks, uh, we train nurse midwives, uh, we train a whole range of healthcare professionals that are clearly needed not only in Brooklyn, but in New York City and New York State in general. So we're very proud of what we do in terms of what we say, uh, training the next generations of health professionals. Um, over the past uh, four months, we have uh, been in the, uh, in the belly of the beast, if you will. We have been, we were designated by Governor Cuomo about on March 20th or so as a COVID only hospital, which means we uh, would only receive for the past three months up until uh, three weeks ago when the governor lifted the designation, we were only taking COVID patients, COVID positive patients. So in other words, we discharged a number of patients who were at our hospital for other things because the governor felt very strongly as the epidemic was beginning to take off uh, that Brooklyn was going to be a, a problem. And he knew that we had the expertise in our hospital, in our academic health science center in terms of the specialists who take care of infectious disease problems, uh, the nurses who deal with the very sick patients, the medical students, the, the, the whole team of doctors and everybody else who takes care of folks. The governor knew that we were a key asset that would help uh, the state of New York and Brooklyn get through this pandemic. So uh, we were honored to, you know, take up the mantle that the governor put on us. Uh, we we treated, I think, up at one point we had over 280 patients who were positive for COVID in the hospital. Uh, we got up to about 80 patients on a ventilator at one time. So this is something that none of us have seen, Rev, in our careers. Uh, I can honestly say I've never been in a situation like I've been in the last three and a half years after being a physician for almost 25 years, where we had very sick patients coming in because of COVID. Uh, there is no 
quote unquote, cure for COVID. So you have to treat the symptoms of the disease. And the symptoms, as you know, are very similar to what we see with the flu, the seasonal flu. But the problem is COVID is so much more deadly and so much, so, uh, so virulent uh, that it has uh, really impacted black and brown communities, principally in Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx to a higher proportion than it has other uh, populations within New York City and New York State. So that's how we've been significantly affected as a community and particularly here in Brooklyn. Okay. Um, let me go uh, directly um, to follow up on some of what you just said, said to health and healthcare disparities. Um, this was given considerable attention during the height of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the disproportionate amount of African-Americans, Caribbean-Americans, Hispanic Americans who were directly affected by this virus. Speak to the issue of health disparities and what, what does that mean for us and how, what practical uh, solutions are there that you would recommend to address this issue? Well, you know, that has been one of the most sobering aspects of this whole uh, sort of pandemic period that we all are living in in Brooklyn is that it has been um, just devastating to black uh, communities, uh, black uh, African American and Afro Caribbean communities here in Brooklyn and in Queens, by the way, um, yeah. because of the high rates of what you refer to, Rev, as healthcare disparities. And what healthcare disparities is, is sort of a, a fancy public health term for all the things that we have in our families, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, obesity, uh, emphysema, lung diseases, uh, kidney diseases, those are the pre-existing conditions or the health disparities that we tend to have more of in our Brooklyn community and in African American communities. So therefore that made the virus a perfect, so we became perfect targets for this virus because even in China, when the first report started coming out uh, just after the new year uh, that this virus was starting to take hold in China, the Chinese were having the experience of those Chinese uh, patients who had diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, and kidney disease were dying and been getting sicker in China. So that's why when it became apparent to me and to many of us uh, down the block at Downstate that this thing was likely to end up in, in the United States and in New York, um, we became very concerned because we know we have high rates of diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease in central Brooklyn, in our neighborhood, in our zip code. And in fact, there's three zip codes that have had most of the patients for us, Rev. 11226, our own zip code, 1120, um, 226, which is another zip code contiguous to us. And I think there's one more. So 80% of our patients came from just three zip codes, which tells you that we have high rates of those healthcare disparities in those three zip codes. And I guess on top of that, uh, we also have uh, many of our, our community members, our neighbors work in jobs where they're in front of the public. Uh, they're serving the public, they're driving, a, they're a driver or, or a, sub, a train conductor for a MTA. Um, they're in some forward facing occupation that put them at greater risk uh, we also know that we tend to have multi-generational households in, in our community where you have uh, uh, grandparents living with grandkids and, and sons and daughters and mother-in-laws and father-in-laws. And what we now know is that there's been a lot of what we call asymptomatic transmission in our community, meaning that a younger person probably went home, brought it into the household. Uh, grandmother, um, you know, big mama got it and big mama got real sick because she had diabetes, because she was obese, because she had kidney disease. And this is where, you know, we think this is where the impact has been so great. So uh, unfortunately, this COVID pandemic has sort of, uh, if you will, um, pulled the scab off or pulled the Band-Aid off or pulled the, the, the cover off the fact that black and brown communities still have significant healthcare disparities that we've got to deal with. Um, going forward. Um, uh, what, what specific role, because um, I know the church plays a powerful role in African-American communities. We are, we are the only uh, institution that every single week we have literally hundreds of people 
that we can speak to. What, um, how do you see the church um, playing a role in speaking to this issue of health disparities? Well, again, you know, the African-American church, the Afro-Caribbean church has been integral to providing all sorts of health education for our community for hundreds of years. Uh, remember health ministries that started in churches like Lenox Road Baptist Church have been very helpful to address issues, uh, to do the health education uh, that we so desperately need. So I know your church has a very active health ministry. Um, I think one of the things that we must do to deal with healthcare disparities is to make sure that your great health ministry and other health ministries at other churches, no matter their denomination, really get good information out to our community. Because at the beginning of this, back in February, uh, we were hearing, I was hearing, I was in a barbershop getting a haircut, and I heard two guys off to the side saying, oh, we can't get COVID. That's something the Chinese get. And, you know, I almost jumped out of the chair, Rev, when I heard that, because I knew that that was patently false. And I had to explain to these brothers why that was wrong. Um, that no, yes, we can, uh, you know, contract COVID. It will be uh, a disease that we can't play with. And here we are on June 24th and look at all the, the black folks we've lost, not only in New York City, um, but I'm really concerned about other parts of the country where many of your congregation have family members. We'll talk about that shortly. Down South is a mess right now tonight. It's an absolute mess down South. And many of us, I'm a native Southerner, as you pointed out, uh, two of my family members in New Orleans had COVID. Uh, so it even affected me as a physician that two of my family members got it. They were deathly sick. They did not, thank God they didn't pass away, but they were very sick and they were in the hospital for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how difficult this disease is, it has been here in New York, even though we have, quote, flattened the curve. We now have to worry about our sisters and brothers down south. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, um, it, it, it's, 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 really, it's really very disheartening to know that despite all of the scientific data that has come out, that we still have people who are saying, you know, they can't get it and so forth. But if, they, uh, if our president does not um, subscribe to what the CDC and other um, health-related institutions are saying, and he has a huge following, and he has a following in Brooklyn too. Um, how, how, do, how do you get around that kind of ignorance, that kind of um, behavior from the highest office in the country? Well, Rev, you know, as I'm sure you would say, um, we got to pray for the president because he needs help. Um, and the, 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 the ignorant statements he makes can be very damaging to our community. Uh, just before joining you on a call, right as Reverend Henry was uh, finishing her terrific prayer, I had just finished watching a segment about the whole issue of masks and why the president and his political supporters are resistant to wearing masks. Well, his own White House task force put out a report that clearly states if you wear a mask, we could save 30 to 35,000 lives in the United States just by wearing a mask. Wow. And this is the frustration that those, those of us in medicine and public health have with the White House and the president is that he's got a super team of physicians and public health experts led by Dr. Fauci. Mm -hmm. um, I know Dr. Fauci personally, I've known him for 15 years. You can go to the bank with anything Tony Fauci says. That's how good this man is. And I hope you saw yesterday, at, uh, he testified before Congress, and he even said that systemic racism has a, been a contributor, an exacerbating factor in the disproportionate impact that COVID has had on black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. Now, you have the White House officials saying there's no systemic racism. Well, here you have Tony Fauci saying it in congressional testimony under oath. And again, that's how good this man is, but the president won't listen to him. And again, I am worried that our community, you know, my, my number one goal is our community in Brooklyn is we've got to protect them, prevent as much death and disability and harm that this COVID virus can wreck in our community. So my message to your congregation, don't listen to the president, mm -hmm. listen to Dr. Fauci. Uh, listen to the, the, the experts that you see on TV. 
Mm -hmm. um, listen to us. I've done TV shows uh, over the past three months on both CNN and MSNBC. We will give you the facts. We will give you the data as we know it. And if there's something changes, we will tell you why it changed and why, why we recommend a certain, a different course of action. Mm -hmm. So for your congregation, make sure that they are engaged with your health ministry, um, that people talk about the, their, their concerns about COVID. They talk about, you know, things that they should be doing, that they're asking questions of you and your health, the, your, the leaders of your health ministry and that they stay informed and unfortunately just tune out the president of the United States because of his ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, March and April were some really, really difficult months that thank God we've come through. Um, what's your assessment as to where we are now locally, uh, central Brooklyn? Uh, um, what's your assessment of where well, we we're, we're very good in central Brooklyn and I'll give you a yardstick at one point in April, we were anybody who walked through our door, 60% of them were testing positive for COVID, right? So anybody who showed up in our emergency room thinking that they were COVID positive or they were short of breath or they were sick, 60% of them turned out to be positive. We are now down to less than 1% of everybody we test is positive. So we went from 60% positive to 1%. That is progress. Yeah. yeah and the yeah. progress, the reason why that was driven down is because we had great leadership in the state of New York. The governor mm -hmm. Cuomo gave great leadership. He came on TV every day. He gave you the facts. He said, stay home, um, wear a mask, social distance. I mean, and this worked. And this is unfortunately what we're not seeing down south. So this, the, the, yeah. the situation in central Brooklyn is excellent right now. Matter mm -hmm. of fact, as of today, I think we only have two patients in the entire hospital with COVID. Wow. So we're at two, we we're at 300 patients back at the peak with just COVID in our hospital. And today we have maybe two. Wow. Yeah. Um, we have been praying for you guys, especially on the front line, doctors and nurses and everybody who had some, some uh, issue or, or, uh, but, but it has been, it has been a journey. Um, downstate, downstate is noted for its specialties. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe also, in fact, I know I'm right that a um, a Nobel Prize uh, a winner actually came from SUNY Downstate. That's right. Um, what are some of the ways that you and other health professionals are are ensuring that the people from our community are receiving the best medical care? Well, again, thank you for those prayers because we felt them and we needed them in, in the midst of this in our darkest hour. We felt. Uh, the positive energy and the positive prayers of you and your congregation, Rev. So thank you so much for that because uh, there were there was a lot of dark days and sleepless nights. And yes. I worried about uh, I worried and prayed and prayed and worried and and prayed and worried some more because I was worried about our 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 patients. Number one, I was worried about the fact that and many times their families could not visit them. Remember, uh, we could not allow. Even the sickest patients, unfortunately, could not have visitors. And the, the, one of the saddest parts of all this is that many patients died without family members being present. And as a physician, I always tried to make sure that near the end of a patient, my patient's life, that the family knew that the end was near to the best of our ability to tell. And that we asked and that I encouraged the family to, to gather around the patient to say their goodbyes. But we couldn't do that in many cases. And so that was one of the saddest aspects of it. Uh, we did start, uh, you know, uh, having FaceTime and video conferences with very ill patients so that at least families could say goodbye over Zoom or FaceTime. We did do that, but it doesn't replace being there to hold somebody's hand as they, as they uh, take their last breath and go to the, to the beyond. Um, so that has, was very tough uh, to deal with. Uh, we did have a lot of patients who died, um, more than I think we anticipated. Um, we had some patients who were very sick, stayed on a ventilator uh, five, six, seven, 21 days, which is very tough on the body to be on a ventilator that long. Uh, we had many patients, about 40% of the patients who did go on a ventilator died. Uh, they just were so sick, they could not uh, come off the breathing machine. So you could see that uh, we really went through uh, some very difficult dark days um, and, you know, my job as a leader is to try to do everything I can to protect our physicians and nurses and caregivers. So my job was, was not only uh, 
you know, focused on, on, on making sure the community knew what was going on, but also I had to spend a lot of my day trying to make sure we had enough PPE, you know, personal protective equipment, um, gowns, uh, mask, um, gloves, you know, face shield, all the things that we knew that would be protective of our caregivers, um, we, we always were in short supply and it was always, that kept me up a lot at night. You know, we got down to, I think less than a thousand gallons in the whole hospital. We were burning through about a thousand gallons a day in the hospital. Um, so that's how tough it got. Then ventilators became a problem. And so again, you know, my job of, of the leader of a, this great organization is to try to get as much resources as I can for our caregivers to take care of the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I want to shift gear, gear, uh, gears just a little bit. Um, uh, SUNY Downstate Health Science University has the only medical school in Brooklyn, as you stated, um, mm -hmm. for, for many years, in fact, as long as I can remember. Um, uh, even though Brooklyn is being gentrified, and, uh, and I think we're still predominantly Black and diverse, um, the concerns that I hear over over and over, and I, and I have shared that with you mm -hmm. uh, personally. Yeah. It, um, we don't see our people being represented in your medical school. So the question is, what is being done to diversify the admissions to make it more representative of the community? Well, great question. You know, I've had some dialogue about that. And, and at the point of my appointment, that was one of the things the SUNY trustees asked me to address was the fact that we did not have enough uh, African-American and even Latino uh, students who were studying medicine. We were fine with nursing and, and some of the other in public health, but we, we really did not uh, have a sufficient cadre of black and Latino students. And I'm proud to say that over the last two years in particular, we have drastically improved that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, for the class that will start in August, we will have, I looked at the numbers today, Rev, we will have about 50 out of 200 either black or brown students. And when you when I got here, we had maybe less than 10. So I've been very intentional uh, with the admissions committee to tell them to get their act together, that we had to better reflect the community we serve in terms of medical students, that the, the medical school did lag the other parts of downstate in its diversity. And so I think we've made some progress. I think we can do better, but uh, 50 out of 200 is, is not bad. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, a good result. It took me making some tough decisions and maybe moving some pe people out who, who were the decision makers. And, uh, um, but as you know, I'm, I'm not afraid to make a tough decision when I know it's for the right reason. Uh, so I think we're improving. Um, and we're, we're looking at it also in terms of our young doctors, our faculty. We wanna recruit more black and Latino faculty. Uh, we've had some success with that in my three and a half years. So again, this is something that uh, you expressed your concern. I heard you, the SUNY board expressed their concern. And I think we made some progress, proud to say. Absolutely. Um, and I'm glad for that uh, because, because I think that's one part of the answer um, when we can see our own color, own people in, uh, in the medical profession. Uh, it certainly helps us as a community. Right. Uh, and you know, the other thing I should share with you in the congregation, this is not just a Brooklyn problem. This is a national problem of the lack of black uh, physicians in this country. Uh, out of, I think, black physicians only account for five to six percent of all physicians in the country. Think about that. Five to six percent. And that's not real good, given that the year I was born, it was only three percent. Mm. And wow. we've only gone up 3% in my lifetime. That's unacceptable. Uh, African-Americans are roughly 13% of the population. We ought to be at about 13% or no less than 10% of the physicians in the country. Just to get to double digits, it's going to take many years. Mm -hmm. uh, so clearly 5 to 6% is not enough. Um, it's not enough. And that's why, I've, like I said, we've made progress here at, at, uh, at Downstate. But this is a national problem. Yeah. Dr. Riley, I'm getting a question from um, Zoom. It says, okay. it says, Dr. Riley, as a healthcare manager, I saw how difficult it was to do our jobs at the peak of the pandemic with a lack of PPE and, vent and ventilation equipment. Do we have any, um, any mechanism in place to ensure that in the event of a second wave, 
that we'll have all the logistics need to get us through. Oh yeah, that's what my biggest concern right now is, uh, is preparing uh, for the fall. Uh, because, um, you know, the second wave is, is, is something we really should worry about. And what we're seeing down south, by the way, is not a second wave. They're just getting their first wave. Yes. They're having a delayed reaction to what we had back in March and April. And if that continues to escalate as we get to, I'm really worried about the time period between Labor Day and Columbus Day mm. or Labor Day and Thanksgiving. That's when we also have the flu season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the other part of what I hope you, you and your health ministry can do is to make sure, number one, they get a flu shot in the fall when it comes out um, because COVID and the flu are hard to distinguish. Mm -hmm. But we do know that COVID is more deadly than the flu. The flu kills too, but COVID is 10 times more deadly than the flu. So if you can get the flu shot, that will protect you from the flu. And then if you should get sick with COVID, we'd be able to figure that out quicker than if you didn't have the flu or didn't have, didn't have flu shot and then came in with either or. And so again, one of the first things we can do in the fall is to make sure that you encourage a flu vaccine and number two, God willing, and the work of terrific scientists like Dr. Fauci, um, by next year at this time, we should have a vaccine, if not by January. Um, and we're going to have to do an education campaign with black and brown communities. And this is where advocacy that I, the, the advocacy that I feel strongly about, look, send that vaccine to the black and brown communities first. Don't send it up there to Westchester. Or, or other parts of New York State that didn't have a whole lot of cases, send it to the communities that have been the most impacted first. Because we know that if we can get the vaccine into black and brown communities and the three zip codes here in central Brooklyn, we can prevent a whole bunch of people from getting sick and dying once that vaccine comes out. So I think it is very likely than not, we will have a vaccine uh, based on Dr. Fauci's work and many people don't know, the, the, the lead scientist in his lab working on a vaccine is a black woman scientist mm -hmm. who works for Tony Fauci. And she is terrific. Um, and she's leading his vaccine group uh, in his lab. A wonderful black woman physician is, is working for Tony, works under him and, and, and just adores him. And he adores her because of her smartness and what, what she's doing. So again, um, uh, you know, as I'm really worried about second wave um, and we have to get prepared. So we're looking at making sure we stock up on PPE. We're looking at making sure we have enough ventilators. We're, we're making sure that we can do more testing. One of the other frustrations I had, Reb, when this was all happening is we couldn't buy the equipment to do the testing. Even though I had the money, I was trying to get a half million dollar machine, have the money in the bank, could not buy the machine to do testing quicker. Um, so we're still waiting on that machine. Can you believe that? We placed the order for that machine in March. And as of June 24, two day, two night, I still don't have that machine for our community. Uh, uh, and it's not an issue of money. Um, mm -hmm. So again, that's the other thing that I do during the day is still fight to get the resources we need to get prepared. So we need more masks. We're stockpiling masks. We're stockpiling gowns. The governor has tried to get us, most hospitals in New York City, New York State, to get about 90 days worth of PPE. That's pretty tough because mm -hmm. most hospitals have about 30 to 45 days of PPE in good times. Wow. So think about it. If every hospital in the country is trying to get to 90, you can see how tough that is logistically. Mm -hmm. So we spend a lot of time on logistics to try to get ready for the fall. Mm -hmm. Um. If, there is a narrative that the vaccines. Some people are some people are averse to vaccines, and mm -hmm. especially this new vaccine, um, in terms of its safety. Uh, how are we going to overcome that narrative that's out there? Well, again, this is part of the the residue of unfortunate events that have happened to Black and Brown communities in this country around. Um, you know, testing and, and so forth. Now, everybody, you know, says, well, you know, I don't want to be a guinea pig. I remember what happened at Tuskegee. And, and Rev, I got to be blunt with you and your congregation. We got to let go at Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. uh, Tuskegee happened, you know, 40, 50 years ago. I don't think another Tuskegee could happen now. 
But the concerning thing is I don't want black and brown communities to miss out on cures for anything, whether it's breast cancer, prostate cancer, COVID, HIV. I don't want our community to not get the same cures that, uh, you know, our white, uh, you know, uh, you know, fellow uh, citizens get in other parts of New York City. So that's why I've been advancing that, look, when the vaccine comes out, if it's been tested and it's safe, and Dr. Fauci says it's safe, we need to get it. And we need to be able, we ought to be some of the first communities to get the vaccine because we've been so disproportionately impacted. Now, again, everybody has anecdotal experience. Well, I got the flu shot one year and I got the flu, or I knew you know, my auntie got the flu and then she died. Well, some of that is just what we call anecdotal evidence that doesn't have, it's not based truly in the science of it. And so again, if getting a vaccine can prevent you or someone in your family from getting COVID, preventing you from going on a ventilator, preventing you from going into the hospital for 21 days, you know, I think that's a good deal. And as a physician, I would tell my patients, take the shot, <laughs> take the shot. Wow, uh, that, is, that, that is just amazing. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, um, as we wind down, uh, you've been living in Brooklyn for th uh, nearly three and a half years. What surprised you the most? You're from down south. What surprised yeah. you when you arrived in Brooklyn and started working at this prestigious institution? Well, you know, um, as a southerner, you know, when you grow up in the south, even though I, I came up north for, uh, for college in Connecticut, and then I went back south to start my career, you, you have an impression of, of Northerners, even black Northerners, that they're not friendly, that they're, you know, they're, uh, they're very uh, tight. But, you know, that to me has been very refreshing that, uh, you know, folks in Brooklyn are, are very nice, very warm. They welcome me with open arms as you and your lovely wife have done and, and your daughter who uh, was able to work with us for a summer. Um, everybody's just been so supportive and and, uh, and, you know, you know, I, I pray too. So I felt those prayers. So that's the power of prayer that, that lifts us all in, in, in good times and bad. So that's been very um, surprising to me how, how, if you will, how down south Brooklyn feels. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, so uh, uh, we have a lot of young people who are watching and listening to you as you speak. Um, how would you how would you encourage them those who want to pursue um, a career in the health sciences or even in medicine what right. would you say to our youth and young adults who are watching you right now well look you know the health professions are one of the, one of the great ways to not only make a great living because we want our kids to make a great living and to help build up communities and so forth and i often say rev that as a physician i feel i have the second highest calling in life you and Reverend Henry, the minister to the, to the soul and the spirit, I minister to the body, the second highest calling. And I think it is a special calling to get into the health professions, whether it's a nurse, a physician, a physician assistant, a phlebotomist, a nurse's assistant. It's a wonderful way um, to serve. And the healing professions are about service. And so I want the young people in your your congregation said, you know, not everybody has to be a doctor to be in healthcare. Um, you could be a physician assistant. You could mm -hmm. be a medical informaticist. You know what that is? That's the specialist who deal with computers and how to help doctors and nurses enter data into computers. That's a great career. Uh, being a midwife, helping women deliver their babies, uh, being in public health, coming up with programs and strategies uh, to improve the health and deal with healthcare disparities. I mean, there's so many wonderful health professions that we have that not only will you make a good living, but you'll feel good about the living you're making. And so that's what we want for our community. We want our young people to put it on their radar that they too could be a nurse or that they could be a hospital administrator. Um, and again, we are so short in all of these professions. Uh, so if any young person in your family and in, in, in whether they're in grade school and they're trying to figure out what they want to do with their life, think about a health profession, you know, think about a pharmacist, think about a social worker, a medical social worker, think about a psychologist. God knows we have such a shortage 
of, of black and brown clinical psychologists. Um, that's another great career. Um, you know, again, so the health professions are just so, um, so rich with opportunity and uh, just an amazing uh, life that you can build for you and your family. Mm -hmm. Great, great. All right, Dr. Riley, one final uh, question. And um, like other institutions, our church and like this, many of the other churches around, we're slowly making our way back to some semblance of normalcy. Um, what are your recommendations to large groups like ours that meet on a weekly basis? Yeah, this is going to be tough for you to hear, Rev, but, um, you know, for example, one of the mainstays of any church, and I know your church is, is, has a great choir, but for the time being, it's not a good idea to have your large choir uh, in, in some of your services. Uh, and I know this is a big sacrifice, but as you've seen from some of the reports around the country, there are well-documented cases around the country where a choir sang and then half of the choir ends up with COVID. Uh, because we just don't know who's asymptomatic spreaders. And we know that COVID is spread by respiratory droplets. So when you're singing and, and praising God and exalting, you're just po possibly propagating the virus unknowingly, unknowingly uh, to others in the congregation, others in the choir. So um, you may have to decrease the density of your choir. For example, how many, how many members is your choir? I think maybe we have about 30 plus, about 30 plus on the choir. Yeah. Or maybe, you may, yeah, yeah you, you may have to design a situation where maybe only half the choir performs at a certain service and they're spaced out a little further, maybe, you know, 10 to six feet apart. Um, or they may have to maybe not sing as much. Um, in the congregation itself, you're going to have to stretch out and socially distance. You may have to have masks on during your services once you, um, I don't know if you've returned to in sanctuary services yet. Uh, but mask wearing is very, very important. Um, and again, the message that we can get out to our community is wear the mask. Um, you know, and I, I told my daughters, get creative with the mask, you know, design your own mask, cut, get your own material, make sure it's double. You know, if you want it more pretty than what you can buy with surgical masks, that's fine. Uh, because we do know that mask wearing, again, can save lives. Uh, the social distance, the hand sanitizer, um, uh, Unfortunately, not too much hand-to-hand -hand con contact right now until we have a vaccine. I think there will be a time we can go back to hugging and kissing and, and high-fiving and shaking hands. When the vaccine comes and it's more widely available, I think we can go to that. But right now, not a good idea. Um, we have to protect each other. We have to be invested in you protecting me and me protecting you. Um, and again, uh, we, we just, in, as we continue to work and pray that... Uh, the scientists get the vaccine right and we get it manufactured and we get it into our community. So it's going to be an adjustment for churches. Yes. Um, you know, we all miss going to church and, you know, uh, but this is, you know, this is, this is something that, that we have to work through as a, as the faith community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, uh, Dr. Riley, we are, I just want to, on behalf of our community, just to say thank you and the staff, faculty and staff, the doctors and nurses, the health professionals, those who clean up the place. We just want to say thank you to you and all of your team from the top to the bottom uh, for your service, for hanging in there, for being our medical institution while we went through this crisis. We were, or I have been really, really moved to know that you guys were there when everybody else was staying home, you guys were you had to be at work. You had to take care of it. And that's just an amazing thing that you have done. So again, I want to thank you and I want to thank you personally. And I hope that you'll be around with us at SUNY Downstate University Health Science for a long, long time to come. Thank you, Rev. Thank you. I look forward to visiting church once we can go back in. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. All, all right. right. Mutual yeah. prayers. Mutual prayers to you and your congregation. Thank you for all you do in Brooklyn. And, and uh, congregation, you guys have a great pastor. As you can tell, he and I are a mutual admiration society, but you have a great pastor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you. All right. Be well. All right. God bless. Take care. Good night. God bless. All right. Bye-bye. So I want to thank, I want to thank again, Dr. Wayne Riley. We didn't get a chance to go to through many of the questions that some of you might have had, but I am really, really thankful that we have 
this powerful, powerful resource in our community. And he is correct. We're beginning to see a shift in the number of, um, of students of color who are being admitted to become doctors, um, uh, being trained at SUNY Downstate, which is just one block over from where we are. And um, Dr. Riley has come and he has made significant changes in some of the things that have gone on um, at SUNY Downstate. They're not a perfect institution. I just need to say that. They're not a perfect institution, but they are far better than what, uh, what we had for many, many years. So again, God bless you and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Riley. Now, I, 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 have, I, have, some, I have some announcements um, that I need uh, members of the community just to be aware of, uh, even though we are still separated. And um, I personally, I'm missing so many of our members. There's a longing to see you. There's a longing to reach out to you. And I, I thank God every time you tune in on a Sunday or on a Wednesday or in small groups or in women's ministry, men's ministry, uh, um, a ministry to kids, we are doing our best to make sure the connection still remains strong. And we ask you to continue to pray for the leadership of Lenox Road Baptist Church. And by the leadership, I mean myself and every minister, every Sunday school teacher, the trustees, everyone um, that is playing some role. Now for a couple of, of announcements for the community. I, uh, it is with great regret that I, I, I announced to you that Sister Marcia Henry, Sister Marcia Henry has passed away. Um, I'm not sure how many of you know her, but Sister Henry has been a long-standing member of our church and has been ill for a considerable amount of time. She went home to be with the Lord this past week, and we want to continue to pray for the family. I do not have as yet any kinds of funeral, uh, uh, funeral arrangements. Um, but as soon as we get that information, we will pass it on to you. Um, Sister, Andy, Sister Andy Edwards is also recovering from surgery and we wanna keep her in prayer. Sister Pat DaCosta will be having eye surgery on Friday of this week. So let's lift up Sister Pat DaCosta in our prayers then we want to pray for sis, sis, Sister Olivia Jackson. Sister, Sister Jackson was one of our new members, recently baptized at the Lenox Road um, Church. Her son was killed in a car accident. And we want to just surround her with, with as much prayer. Please, my brothers and sisters, I'm asking you to lift up Sister Olivia Jackson in prayer. She needs it. And... And, and, and for the rest of the family. We also wanna pray for Sister, Sister Yvette Richards, who is also in recovery. We've been praying for her for a while. And finally, uh, Brother Richard Clark from Florida uh, is asking us for prayer. So right now, as we get ready to close, I wanna close um, our time together with corporate prayer. I wanna thank Dr. Henry for just ministering in such a profound way. But let's pray everywhere. If you're around your dining table and you're able to hold the hands of a person beside you in your bedroom, wherever you are, it's time for us to close out with prayer. Eternal God and our Heavenly Father, we come before you again, and we come in the name of Jesus Christ. We come, O oh God, thanking you for institutions such as SUNY Downstate University, University of Health Sciences. We thank you, oh God, for Dr. Wayne Riley and the team of doctors and nurses, health professionals, pharmacists, a ra um, a radio technicians, Lord, all the people that work at SUNY Downstate Hospital. We thank you for their labor of love through March and April and May, and now June, we thank you for reducing the high volume of COVID patients from 
60% down to 1%. That is indeed an answer to prayer. And we thank you, oh God, that you are hearing our prayers. We continue to walk by faith and not by sight. So I pray, oh Holy Spirit, that you would continue to provide healing for our community, the health disparities in our community. Lord, we pray that you would make a way that this systemic problem throughout the nation would be addressed. Now, oh God, we lift up those who have personally called us and say, pray for me. We lift up the family of Sister Marcia Henry. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would comfort them during this time of loss. We thank you for the recovery for Sister Andy Edwards. We pray that you would continue to bring full recovery to her. We pray for Sister Pat Costa on Friday as she goes in for eye surgery. You guide the doctors, Lord. You know how delicate an operation this is. And I ask you right now that you would be with her. We thank you, oh God, for the outcome. And then, Lord, we lift up Sister Olivia Jackson, whose son was killed in a car accident. Oh God, a mother's grief, a mother's tears. I pray right now, Lord, that you would be with Sister Jackson in a very special way, that you would comfort her. Lord, even as there is immense grief, be with them during this time. We pray for Sister Yvette Richard's recovery. We thank you for what has been done so far, and we pray for an excellent outcome. We lift up Richard Clark in Florida. I pray, oh God, that you would be with him, whatever the concerns and the needs are, that you would be with them in this hour of prayer. We thank you for our church community. Lord, we are separated from each other. Grant us the wisdom as to how to make our way back. Grant us the wisdom to determine what we should cherish and what we should let go of as we return to the house of God. Thank you again, O oh God, for your mercies and your love. And we commit ourselves into your hands. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. And the people of God, wherever you are, would you just type in amen or hallelujah, God bless, uh, whatever the spirit leads you just to type in as an affirmation of what we're doing. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Our meal program continues, our grab and go continues on Saturday at, um, of this week at 11 a.m. So we ask you to join us. Brother Thomas is asking for more assistance. So if you are able to come out and to help to separate the food and help to pack some of the bags, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Of course, social distancing, the wearing of masks is mandatory if you're going to be working with us. Again, God bless you and have a blessed night. Our communications department, Shannon, we would...
LRBC, thank you so much for joining us for our prayer meeting and community conversation with Dr. Wayne Riley, the president of SUNY Downstate. Now we encourage you to join us once again on Sunday at 11 a.m. for our virtual worship service. Remember the building is closed, but online on Zoom, Facebook and YouTube is always open. Remember that our scholarship application is still open until July 31st. So all graduating high school seniors, please remember to submit your application. This Saturday, again, we are excited to host our grab and go food pantry from 11 a.m. until 12.30 p.m. If you're interested in volunteering, please email us at info at lrbc.net and make sure you come with your face mask and, and your protective gear for that volunteer opportunity. And if you need some food, definitely come on out as well. As always on Sundays, after our regular church service, we host a virtual kids ministry meeting at 3 p.m. for kids in grades pre-K through sixth grade. Sign up at the link on our website. And of course, you know me, I want you to follow us on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts at LRBC, our Lenox Road Baptist Church. Stay blessed. Have a wonderful evening. Stay safe and stay inside. Love you, LRBC.